So, um, I was going to talk today, uh, I'll mention the book project a little bit uh, in broad strokes, and then talk about how some particular questions about, uh, you broadly put them in the framework of explainable AI, uh, in particular applied to large language models, fits into that book project. Um, my entrance, you know, most broadly from philosophy into understanding the implications of Deep learning generally, not just large language models, but all other kinds of deep neural networks out there, is as understanding and, and fitting into this very old philosophical debate that goes all the way back to Plato and Aristotle, at least in some form. It's a debate over the origins of abstract knowledge. Abstract knowledge is just any knowledge that's you know more general uh, or more abstract than your sort of immediate perceptual experience. You know, like I see a particular. Uh, green bottle here now, but even recognizing the abstract properties, this is a bottle, you know, this is green, rather than just being kind of a particular image, is already a little bit of abstract knowledge. And philosophers had fought from the very beginning uh, as to whether that abstract knowledge came from somehow collating and extracting patterns from sensory experience, you know, sight, taste, uh, sound, and so on, or from kind of unpacking an innate mental endowment. Uh, Plato in particular, uh, having a bunch of famous arguments in his dialogues that uh, the most abstract knowledge, especially in the cases of like mathematics and logic and ethics had to come from sort of an innate grasp of those issues. You know, he had a story about uh, reincarnation and in between lives, you're kind of floating around in this perfect world of knowledge and you get exposed to you know, perfect triangles and perfect squares and perfect goodness and beauty. Uh, and then you go through this traumatic experience of being born into a, a measly human body and trapped in the physical world where there's only kind of imperfect echoes of those abstract properties. And it's only through your recollection of your exposure uh, to those properties that we are able to recognize things like triangles or, or goodness or beauty. Today, we would replace that story about uh, reincarnation probably with something about evolution, right? Uh, you know, uh, evolutionary psychology tends to be the modern form of the, the nativist view, the idea that we've got some kind of knowledge that's innate within us that gets kind of unpacked uh, when we are exposed maybe to certain sensory experiences, but it's not learned primarily or wholly from those sensory experiences. It needs to somehow already be innate within us. And I think that's a good framework for understanding uh, what might be new about deep learning's achievements recently, especially when you compare it to other approaches to artificial intelligence that were perhaps more common or popular since the 1960s, like expert systems type approach or so-called GoFi, good old fashioned AI, which involved programming manually a lot of uh, particular abstract knowledge into the system from the beginning, rather than the machine learning approach, which is getting very large data sets, right? And then uh, throwing an artificial neural network with some simple learning rules, uh, throwing that data at those artificial neural networks and then hoping that they extract the abstract knowledge from experience. So the kind of general opposition between these two approaches to artificial intelligence um, is a continuation of an echo certain key aspects of this much older philosophical debate about the origins of abstract knowledge in humans and perhaps animals. So that's the general framework. Um, like I said, you know, this some some version of this debate between Plato here saying we get abstract knowledge from sort of the perfect Platonic heavens and Aristotle saying no, it's abstracting patterns from sensory experience down here has appeared in uh, you know every generation and near every uh, academic discipline you can find some recognizable form of this divide. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting about its modern incarnation in uh, artificial intelligence today is that we can kind of turn this into a testable empirical question. It's not just this timeless philosophical riddle anymore. Um, in particular, we might be able to now make more progress on the question. We just build some models according to uh, nativist or rationalist principles, and we build some other models according to empiricist principles. That is, we you know compare the models that have a lot of manually programmed innate knowledge from the beginning to the models that have more powerful learning mechanisms and larger, maybe more realistic data sets. 
to train them on and just see which ones are more successful or human-like. So I'm optimistic that now we're making new kinds of progress on this question that, that perhaps we couldn't before. Um, I'm not the only person to draw this connection. In particular, scientists are independently drawing this connection, very influential scientists. So here you have Judea Pearl, maybe the most influential living computer scientist, has a blog post where he ties recent advances in machine learning to this uh, uh, view he calls radical empiricism, the idea that you can like, extract all knowledge from conditional probabilities in the data, which he attributes to David Hume, famous philosophical empiricist. Um, there's also this influential behavioral and brain sciences article by Lake Goldman, Tenenbaum, and Gershman, um, which is one of the most early and, and critical uh, takes on deep learning that was very influential in, in shaping the arguments we have today. And they say, they tie this kind of empiricism to Alan Turing's views or some things that Alan Turing wrote towards the end of his career. The idea that the child's mind is a notebook with rather little mechanism and lots of blank sheets. Uh, and the mind of the child machine would be filled up by responding to rewards and punishments similar to reinforcement learning. They then tie this view to uh, psychological behaviorism, this uh, movement in American psychology, North American psychology in particular, uh, in the first half of the 20th century, especially attributed to David Watson and B.F. Skinner, this idea that you could only sort of focus on stimulus response relationships um, at the periphery of organisms, and that's really what you were studying. And you couldn't posit any internal representations or algorithms that were driving the behavior. Um, and they say cognitive science has repudiated this oversimplified behaviorist view that came to play a central role. So there's this very, and you find this all over the place. It's a very common set of inferences. You go um, artificial neural networks, therefore empiricism, therefore psychological behaviorism, therefore obviously false, <laughs> you know, uh, repudiated by cognitive science because we know minds do more than that. And I want to call into question sort of like every step in that argument. I think it's all wrong. And that's one of the things that I do in the first two chapters of my book. So basically, they're saying, you know, this is all just BF Skinner. And wasn't that terrible? We should never do that again. Um, we have to do better than this. This is not a good framing. I'll explain why. Um, in particular, what I think is missing from this framing, both in the construal of classical empiricist philosophers like Aristotle and, and John Locke and David Hume, uh, Adam Smith, Sophie de Grouchy that I talk about in my book, uh, and in much contemporary deep learning research, is that empiricists do think that we start with a basic, what we now call cognitive architecture, or you might also call it a faculty taxonomy, a set of basic psychological faculties that you can use repeatedly, apply them to different situations. And that's how the empiricists think you extract abstract knowledge from sensory experience. It's not you know, in other words, if you ask Steven Pinker or Gary Marcus, what is the empiricist view? They'll say it's the blank slate. What do you mean by the blank slate? They mean like literally a piece of stone, <laughs> you know, like, and they'll say, uh, of course, you can subject any amount of sensory experience to a piece of stone and it won't learn anything uh, from the from the opportunity. You know, these empiricist philosophers, these machine learning researchers, they're not that stupid. They know that's that's not the view they've been recommending all along. So I think there's a real misunderstanding here about what the empiricist view even really is or, or should be. Um, in particular, um, you know, so like I said, Steven Pinker thinks it's like literally a, a blank slate. Gary Marcus tries to uh, give you a kind of formal specification of this view. He says you could think of cognition as a function over four variables, A, R, K, and E, where A is innate algorithms, R is innate representational formats, K is innate knowledge, and he's experienced. And he says a true blank slate would set K and R to zero a to some extremely minimal value, like one reinforcement learning rule, and the rest would be uh, given to experience. And he says, this is the view Locke articulated when he said all ideas come from sensation and reflection. When I read this paper by, by Marcus, this was when I was like, I got to write a book about this. This is so wrong. Because if you read even the next few pages of Locke, uh, he'll talk about memory, imagination, attention. So basically, this is a straw man view um, that nobody ever really defended. Um, and what's missing from it is a basic cognitive architecture. And some version of this was accepted or defended by basically every major empiricist philosopher. And I think by most deep learning theorists today, especially at DeepMind, uh, maybe a little less at OpenAI, but I think uh, a lot of uh, uh, even large language model researchers are coming around today to recognizing the value of what we would call now an agent architecture or a cognitive architecture in which, for example, a large language model might be embedded. Um, so what's what's the use of philosophy here? 
Um, the question of empiricism versus rationalism sees as having crucial consequences for engineering methodology. Namely, what's the best way to make future progress? Should we build in more manual knowledge from the beginning, or should we try to build in more powerful domain general learning mechanisms um, to, to you know, reach the next benchmarks or, or achievements in AI? But this connection is not being drawn in the most productive way. Um, deep learning channels the historical empiricist, not the psychological behaviorist like Watson and Skinner. So if anybody tries to sell you that line, just say, no, you know, uh, Professor Buckner told me that's not right. Let's try again. Um, and I think machine learning can, can fill some of these gaps left by the historical empiricist, showing how physical systems built according to empiricist principles can perform operations that empiricists described as like magic. So there's a number of places in the empiricist philosophy from especially John Locke and David Hume, where they say, you know, abstraction can do this, or imagination can do this, or memory can do this, but they give you no explanation as to how. And they're often even quite upfront about that. You know, David Hume, a few places says it's as if by magic. He doesn't mean it's literally magic. He just means like, I know there's a thing happening, but I don't, you know, I don't have neuroscience. I don't have psychology. I don't have computer science. I can't explain it. And I'm going to be honest about that. And I, there's something I appreciate about that attitude. But at the same time, he got beat up on a lot by his contemporaries for, you know, asserting confidently that this thing happens, but giving no explanation as to how it does it. It looked kind of like he was just uh, asking for a blank check to explain anything that was a problem for his theory. And then, uh, especially with the imagination. Um, so philosophy can surely benefit, but I think engineers could also benefit uh, by continuing to mine gems from the history of philosophy, especially for more general ideas about cognitive architecture. So one of the things I talk a lot about in the book is we have a lot of one-off examples of places where you get big gains in the technical abilities of a model by adding, say, a memory module or an imagination-like module or an attention module, right? But few people have been putting these all together in a whole cognitive architecture in the way that we really tried to do quite extensively in previous generations of AI. If any of you know uh, models like ACTAR or SOAR, uh, they tried to do this um, with earlier approaches, but they didn't have deep learning. You know, they didn't have the gains that we have today. Uh, so now we need to, with, you know, sort of fully deep learning architecture, start to reach reach back again towards a complete cognitive architecture for artificial intelligence. Um, just to give an example that this is, in fact, what a lot of deep learning researchers are doing. This is from a position paper by Goyal and Bengio, who, you know, you probably have seen in the neighborhood. Um, and they say uh, they attribute some of the biggest gains in recent uh, deep learning models as due to sort of domain general inductive biases that are imposed by uh, particular neural network architectures. So now, you know, in the 80s, an artificial neural network was really pretty simple in its architecture. You know, typically you'd have three or four layers of artificial neurons, you know, arranged in a stack, and they'd probably be all the same type of activation function. But really today it's much more complicated. There's really a big palette of different architectures, activation functions, uh, pre and post processing, um, all sorts of stuff you can appeal to. And they analyze it in terms of the domain general inductive biases that these different architectural choices might uh, make your network better or worse at solving. But it's crucially not domain specific abstract knowledge. Like you're not building in an innate domain specific concept of a triangle or an innate domain specific concept of, you know, a cause or even a social agent. It's more general than that. I mean, the idea is you can apply that to sort of any type of problem and you'll still get benefits. I can say a lot more about that in the Q&A, but I, I spend a lot of time talking about that in the book if anybody wants more details. So the general shape of the book project, uh, after I kind of set the stage in the first two chapters, is each chapter has a particular psychological faculty, um, like perception, imagination, memory, attention. Then it has a kind of empiricist of the week. You know, I could have talked about dozens of different empiricist philosophers, but I just picked one that had a particularly cool view of this faculty that fit well with recent uh, achievements in deep learning. And then I explain how some of those ideas that that philosopher had about how that faculty works and contributes to rational cognition uh, could be seen as being vindicated or realized by particular deep learning models uh, lately. So the thought is you're seeing this nice uh, concordance between speculative philosophical ideas and um, recent achievements in AI. But then the philosophers also thought you know, further than uh, the engineering has gotten yet. So there's still a lot of kind of like to-do lists and suggestions about what kinds of experiences you might need to give these models to 
reach greater degrees of flexibility and rational control. So I think there's there's a potential for a productive exchange there between philosophy and machine learning. I call this view um, the new empiricist dogma. Maybe only the other philosophy professor here will get that joke. Um, uh, he can explain it later. Uh, but the uh, this is uh, the idea is captures domain general modular architecture. The idea being that the future is going to be with cognitive architectures that are kind of modules of different deep learning neural network um, uh, architectures that are put together in kind of a global agent like system. And there's going to be a lot of interesting problems that pop up when you try to do that, like coordinating different modules and how to train them efficiently and so on. So I talk about all that in the book. Um, but let's now get to common objections and get to the interpretability stuff. So a common objection to deep learning as AI, you probably heard the sort of stochastic parrot line, or you might hear people say, ah, you know, these models can do cool things, but it's just giant piles of linear algebra, or it's just all statistics, um, or they're just kind of parroting back certain aspects of their data sets. Um, you know, I want to know, what does this objection really amount to? Um, in a couple papers, like, for example, the one that I think I shared, I recently published with Raphael Millier and is on archive. Um, we call this, or at least worry that a lot of these arguments are what we call a redescription fallacy, which is where you redescribe a model structure in terms of something really lower level. And it looks like it couldn't possibly be the type of thing that could implement this, you know, really interesting cognitive or mental phenomenon. Um, but, you know, we can say things like that about the brain. We could be like, how could the brain actually implement rational cognition? After all, isn't it just a bunch of neural firings? You know, so it, it can't be the mere fact that you can redescribe what something is due in kind of lower level or deflationary terms that makes it ineligible. It's got to be about, you know, how do you arrange the neural firings? Um, how do you arrange the linear algebra to, uh, you know, can those be uh, uh, arranged or hooked up in a way that sort of functionally it's implementing some interesting processes or algorithms that have important psychological properties that we're interested in. That's got to be the question. So, you, you know, how, do, how would we answer that charge? Could, you know, the, the linear algebra, the statistical calculations be organized in a way such they're doing things that are relevant to all of these psychological faculties I've been talking about? Um, and I'll just talk about one particular way of operationalizing that question for the rest of the talk today. Um, I think the worry must be they don't actually represent the world or have world models, right? And you see this a lot also if you if you push a little bit harder in these debates. The worry is really like they're just kind of spitting back out um, snippets of their training sets, uh, but they don't really represent, they don't understand the properties or the concepts or the relationships that they're they appear to be speaking about, for example. Um, how would we how would we rebut that worry if that's the real worry? And you know, I'd agree. If they don't have world models, then they're probably not doing anything like what we're doing. So the question can be operationalized, I think, in a useful way as to whether their training with these domain general biases allows them to acquire representations of objects and properties, you know, concepts of the world and how things in it work that would be equivalent to what humans and animals learn. Or are they just kind of spitting back out snippets of their training sets? So how can we compare representations in the brain? for our world models, you might say, to representations in deep neural networks. One basic conceptual framework that if you had a cognitive science course or a philosophical foundations of cognitive science course you've probably heard of is David Marr's levels of analysis. The idea here is that there's three levels at which you can describe and start to explain some cognitive phenomena. There's the computational level, which is kind of in terms of input-output relationships. What's the data that the system has to work with and what is the output it's expected to uh, produce as a result of being given that input. Then you typically try to go down to what we call the algorithmic level, which is you specify sort of a series of operations and intermediate representations, you know, that would be involved in kind of like writing an algorithm in computer code that's actually taking the input and converting it through a series of describable steps into the output uh, in a reliable, you know, flexible, uh, appropriately um, powerful way. And then you go down to the implementational level, which is how are those algorithms actually realized in the physical system that's uh, that's performing the calculation. So, you know, that's obviously going to be different whether we're talking about a, uh, a digital computer or a brain. Uh, so what you're typically looking for in cognitive science is for a kind of correspondence at the algorithmic level of explanation. That is, you want to see that there's intermediate representations that are kind of causally relevant in the right sequence to converting the input information into the output information. 
So, um, you know, there's a potentially infinite number of input output equivalent machines for any functional description. That's another reason why you want to really want to see is there the same algorithmic uh, decomposition going on between the two systems and systems that only match the computational level description might not tell us that much about intelligence. Maybe they're relevant as a kind of proof of concept. There's a cool paper by uh, uh, Warstadt and Bowman here where they say, you know, like large language models are at least a proof of concept that you can produce, you know, the kind of thing that Chomsky thought uh, was a part of human grammatical competence. But maybe the the learning sets are so different that it really doesn't show that that's what we do or it's much like what we do. Um, but there's special reason to worry that DNNs might emulate our behavior without really much algorithmic similarity under the hood, right? Um, in particular, they have much larger data sets and massive amounts of training computation is required, you know, probably a lot more than the equivalent wattage of the human brain in childhood. Um, and there's also special worry because artificial neural networks can be shown through technical results to be universal function approximators with enough data, at least in principle, they can learn sort of any function, even a highly complex one, uh, like might be behind human grammatical uh, linguistic competence. Um, there's also technical results, I can talk more about this later if there's time, that they have extreme memorization ability. So I don't want to like poo-poo or minimize the uh, the worry that uh, any particular result they might give us in say a benchmarking test or a particular interaction with a large language model could just be regurgitation from the training set. I do think this is the relevant kind of null hypothesis that in any particular case, you need to rule out to have confidence that you've shown there's something cognitively interesting going on in the large language model. But I do think in at least some cases, this can be rebutted. I'll say why later. So there's a simple argument for deep neural networks as cognitive models. Um, it often goes like this. You say, well, I can train up a linear decoder that is just a simple uh, linear uh, decoding method on the activation vectors of a trained up deep neural network and show that these models carry the same information as the representations humans are thought to use on the cognitive task. And we've been doing this since you know, 2015, 2016 at least, and showing that even say vision models seem to have information about the very same features that we learn when we learn to do, say, a visual categorization task. Um, the information is there and it's it's in the model, right? So early on, people said, oh, wow, you know, we compare information in the brain, in the visual cortex in particular, to information in these visual classificatory networks. They seem to have information about the same features. Doesn't that show they're using the same algorithm? There's still reason for concern here, right? But I'll give you the full argument. If DNNs learn and manipulate the same representations as humans, then they might be learning the same algorithms as humans. Therefore, deep neural networks can be used as models to investigate the algorithms that humans use to solve cognitive tasks. Uh, but the objection is that the DNN activations might have recoverable information about representations, but that information like isn't understood or isn't like appropriately deployed by the model. Um, let me give you a quick example to kind of illustrate that worry. Um, uh, imagine I go out to my cousin's house in Katy. Katy is a big suburb of Houston, right? Where, uh, you know, uh, you imagine there's suburbs of Toronto that are probably pretty much like Katy, right? Um, and they have up on the wall this live, laugh, love uh, letters that absolutely drive me crazy, right? And on this, this last visit, they all leave the room and I'm like, that's it. I'm done with this really obnoxious decoration. And so I decide to go out back uh, and I throw these letters into their pond in their backyard, right? Um, when I throw the letters into the pond, right, they're going to create ripples on the surface of the water, right? And those ripples are going to have information about the particular letters and the order in which they were thrown in the water. Where if you had a sufficiently powerful decoding method, you know, you could have a camera looking at the ripples on the surface of the water, and you could recover which letters were thrown in and the order in which the letters occurred. But that doesn't mean the pond understands which words were thrown in, right? Um, or, you know, so uh, the moral here is that the pond surface does contain information that would be available to some of these, you know, sufficiently sophisticated decoder methods. But that doesn't mean that they represent those words or they implement them, uh, implement algorithms uh, in any interesting sense that, that do so. So we need to do, we need to somehow show more than just there's information there. We need to show that the information is used would be, I'd say, what's missing. Uh, the output that they produce needs to be uh, uh, produced by using that information in an appropriate way in the process. How would we show that? Um, so I'm going to skip over this for time. 
So in fact, I'll, this will just point out that like the stuff I was talking about with deep convolutional neural networks earlier, there are there is in fact a lot of research directly comparing uh, the information present in a trained up large language model to the information present in the language areas, the left infrotemporal areas of the human brain. And you find the same result that we found in deep convolutional neural networks for visual categorization, that they do in fact have a lot of the same information about a lot of the same properties, whether they're lexical, syntactic, semantic, and so on. So we have the same state with the information's there, but we want to know whether it's used or not. Um, so uh, Yamans and DiCarlo it was one of the first papers that actually showed this correspondence in the visual categorization models. Uh, and they were pretty sophisticated, actually, I think, in terms of the philosophy under the hood. They articulated explicitly the epistemic criteria that they'd be using to say this is not just a false hit on the, the linear decoder method. They said in particular uh, to think that we're, we're matching Mars algorithmic level with our, our deep neural network. We need to show that the models are image computable. That is, they can compute the right answer. That is, for example, the right label to put on an image. Uh, from the very same visual input that humans get. That's something we could never do before in artificial intelligence, and we can do now. Um, they also need to be mappable. That is, they need to have identifiable components in the model that correspond to intermediate components in the mind and brain. And they did even show there was a mappable correspondence between layers of the deep neural network and layers of the ventral stream cortex, which was pretty cool. Um, and they also need to be quantitatively predictive. That is, predict the response of all the neurons in the area. Um, and they claim on the basis of these properties that these deep convolutional neural networks are the best models we currently have for the visual cortex, uh, processing in the visual cortex. But it doesn't really solve this uh, this worry that I, I mentioned earlier about uh, uh, the information's there, but we haven't really proven it's being used yet. So how would we do that? Um, I'm going to skip over RSA because it would take way too long to explain. And it's subject to the same criticisms, really. This is a just have you had any talks about RSA in this series? No, not too much. No. All right. Well, I can come back to it if you want. But the long and short of it is, is it's it's just another linear decoder method, but it looks for higher order correspondences rather than uh, just particular representations. So in other words, it looks like has it has it appeared to organize the whole informational space in the same way rather than just does it seem to have some subset of activations that match? Uh, the activations in the brain, but it's it's subject to the same worry, just kind of at the meta level. Um, let me get to the interesting part. So, how would we how would we get beyond these purely informational methods? Right, what's missing? Um, one idea is that um, we can rank different explanations for an ability according to what philosophers would call explanatory power. Explanatory power has many dimensions. Um, in particular, they suggest explanatory power is grounded in these contrasted counterfactual inferential ability, questions like what if things had been different, okay? Where the idea is if you have a more powerful explanation, uh, you can answer questions, well, what if the input had been different here? What if the, in the input had been different here? Or what would I have to change to get this other output? Or, you know, what if the belief or the representation or the world model in the system had been different in this case, right? Those are going to give us a much more powerful explanation for the kind of processing that's going on in the model um, if we can answer a lot of these questions. So I'll skip that too. Um, so I'm going to jump right to the most important part, which is the ability to do interventions on the model. So not just... Um, showing that the information we think is present in the brain is also present in the system, but showing that we can intervene on that information in a way that consistent with our hypothesis, if the system is actually using this as a representation, as part of its algorithm to convert input to output, it should change the resulting downstream calculations and produce a different behavior, right? So the idea is by doing that, by intervening on the system, instead of just looking for information, we can provide an additional kind of confirmation for these, these representation algorithm level hypotheses about degrees of similarity between the deep neural network and the human brain. The simplest kind has actually been with us, the simplest kind of intervention that is, has actually been with us since the at least the 80s and maybe even a lot earlier. And that's just like ablation, 
So this is, you know, similar to lesion studies in, uh, um, in the brain, right? So a lot of what we think we know in cognitive neuroscience today is a result of studying either uh, intentionally induced lesions in animals or, you know, special cases of brain damage in humans. Uh, you might have heard of HM, for example, or KC, who, you know, supposedly had very selective brain damage to their medial temporal lobes that interfered with episodic memory. Uh, but left semantic memory intact. And so we conclude from that that, you know, oh, this is probably the part of the brain that's doing the algorithmic computations relevant for episodic memory. Um, we can do these types of simple ablation experiments in uh, deep neural networks as well, right? So if we have a linear decoder that locates something that we're hypothesizing is a part of a world model for that domain or a particular concept or representation of some property we're interested in, we can ablate the, the nodes responsible for that, that activation pattern. And then see, does the does it look like then the system forgets that knowledge, right? Does it look like it no longer has this particular belief? But then the other beliefs or other aspects of the world model are relatively preserved. We might think that's good evidence that our original hypothesis about the function of this particular activation was correct. So like I said, we've done this from the beginning. Um, and it works pretty well. It often works in many particular deep learning models. But there's, I don't, I don't think this is perfect yet. I still have some reservations about simple ablation methods. I have them both in human neuroscience and in artificial neural networks. In particular, we think that both in the brain and in artificial neural networks, very often um, representations are what we call widely distributed across many different nodes. So we don't think there's like a single node that is your cat, you know, a single neuron in your brain that's the cat concept and a single neuron in your brain that's the dog concept. We think actually it's spread across a very wide network all over the brain, you know, maybe involving thousands or more of uh, tens of thousands of neurons. And moreover, uh, the neurons that are responsible for your cat concept might share some neurons with uh, your the neurons responsible for your dog concept, right? Uh, and that's just the way the brain works. In fact, we might think that's one of the things that allows for generalization ability uh, in the brain, where if two concepts are similar to one another, you get this property of kind of free generalization. Uh, if you learn something new about the one concept, because you're changing some of the values of the nodes shared with the other similar concept, you might get some additional free generalization to the other concept as well. So it's not just a quirk of um, artificial neural networks that the representations might be distributed. It could be like kind of a important principle about brains that we want to save. And these simple ablation methods kind of don't respect that, right? Um, we might be getting false positives, for example, if we ablate something, but really at the same time, we're actually ablating uh, the nodes responsible for you know variety of different concepts we might get a false positive. We thought it was representing this, but really it was representing this other thing and we've damaged them both. And so we get an apparently positive result when maybe we should be more skeptical. Um, luckily there's some even cooler intervention methods and there's really been an explosion of these methods in the last year. You can think of them largely as not just ablating a representation, but actually editing the value and editing it in a very specific way that's hypothesis driven in a particular direction and consistent with, um, you know, the theory that we have about the role that this particular representation is playing in the world models that this system may or may not have learned. So um, these are all represented as vectors, you know, in one way or another. And the thought is you you adjust the the vector representation in some part of the network for some particular data point or exemplar in a particular hypothesis driven way. You could try to toggle a property, for example, or you could try to change the attribute of that um, property in the world model. And then you see, does does the the if we're talking about a large language model, does it then go on to make completions in your text prompts that are consistent with having changed a belief about the status of that property or the status of that object in the world, right? I think this is very cool and exciting. So one example is this paper by uh, Lee Nye and Andreas. Is there's a group at Stanford that's been doing tons of this stuff. Um, they trained up large language models on this artificial chemistry data set that's called the alchemy data set, right? And so it describes a bunch of chemistry experiments. You have a series of beakers and you have a series of different chemicals and you can put different chemicals in the beakers in different amounts. And then you say, mix the contents of beaker two into the contents of beaker one, and then it changes color, right? You give it a bunch of these uh, artificial chemistry experiments, 
And then it can, in fact, go on to predict correctly the results of novel chemistry experiments uh, that you've never actually given it the setup for before, right? So it looks like there's some generalization going on about, say, what are the actual chemical properties of this chemical and so on. Um, but you want to know, is that really right? Okay. So again, one theory is that these systems do this by building a world model of this artificial chemistry situation where they, they actually have a representation of chemical A and its properties, a representation of chemical B. They have a representation of beaker one and its contents and beaker B and its contents and so on. So what they do here is they localize using the information uh, linear decoder method, uh, the candidate activation vectors for uh, something that's like recording the proper, the current contents of beaker A, let's say. Then they give it a text description that should give it the belief that beaker A is full, right? In other words, if I then go on in a text prompt, say, can I put two milliliters of chemical B in beaker A? It'll say, no, I'm sorry, you can't, it's full. It can't hold any, right? Which is the correct answer. But we want to know, is it really representing that? Or is it just kind of mimicking previous text patterns when the beaker was full without really understanding and having a flexible world model? But once you've localized the representation, um, you can also now localize the representation for the current contents of beaker B, which is, according to the text description before, empty. And you can cut and paste the part of the uh, activation vectors that you think is recording the status of beaker B onto the current status of beaker A. So this is just vector arithmetic, right? It's just taking part of the vector, cutting and pasting it into um, uh, uh, the, the vector that you think is recording the status of beaker A. Then you ask, okay, having done that intervention on the activation vectors, does the system now let me pour more stuff into beaker A? And at least for one of the models they did, um, it was getting 75% you know, correct answers to the altered scenarios, whereas previously it would say, no, it didn't work for all the models, which is kind of interesting. Maybe there's some architectural issues here, uh, which wouldn't be surprising. You know, Maybe only certain types of architectures are actually able to learn wor word models and others aren't. But the critical point is this is not something that the model was trained to do, right? The model was not trained to get the correct answers to direct interventions on its activation vectors. And so the thought is, according to some of the best criteria in philosophy of science today, it actually suggests that um, this thing really is playing this role, a causal role in the conversion of the input to the output, uh, which is all you could ever really expect from a world model anyway. Okay. Uh, there's a bunch of other examples of this. Um, I'll give you a couple others. This is a particularly cool one. So in linguistics, you know, if you were interested primarily in like Chomsky and linguistics and generative grammar, uh, some of the computational linguists that are working on large language models and have the hypothesis that they really are representing, say, syntactic grammatical properties of sentences, have a method that they've called iterative null space projection to show that some of those models are really being represented. This particular paper looks at uh, relative clause membership. So there's a question whether the model's representing some word as being in one clause or another. And the way the sentence is correctly interpreted, kind of it's ambig it's syntactically ambiguous, right? Depending on which way it's it's which clause it's representing the word as being a member of. Uh, and they have this method where what they do is they divide the activation vectors of the large language model into two different subspaces, where the one subspace is all the activation vectors that have information about this property, say relative clause membership. And the other one is the subspace where it doesn't have information about relative clause membership. Now, once you do that, you can put the sentence into the model, get it encoded in the transformers uh, uh, processing and project the activation vector for that sentence after it's gone through all the self-attention machinery across to the other subspace. You don't, in other words, like a mirror projection of that activation vector, which is the thought is you leave all of the other dimensions unchanged but you project it across that to the other subspace. Now, if that's right, um, that that really is the representation of that grammatical property of the sentence, then you should be like either subtracting out or if you were taking it from not having information about that property and projecting it to the subspace where it now does have information about that property, you should be able to toggle the value of that grammatical property in the way that the sentence gets interpreted by the network later on. And this method, again, has some promising results across a variety of other different studies to suggest that uh, these models really are representing these grammatical properties um, 
not just having information, but that information is actually used and, and that you can toggle completions with respect to that grammatical property through this iterative null space projection. Now, something that was particularly interesting to me is that it seems like we might also be able to go the other direction. So uh, in these cases, we're going from understanding or theory about how humans solve the task with the algorithms they're using to then using intervention methods to confirm that that's the way the artificial neural network is actually solving the problem too. But there are also some methods, and this is really exciting to me as a philosopher of science, where we go in the other direction. That is where we have an artificial model that can solve some task, but we don't know how humans do it. We don't have a theory about where in the brain it's done or how it's done in the brain. And we can localize uh, particular representations that do these things in the deep neural network and then go back and we know what to look for in the human imaging, like fMRI or EEG. That's really cool. And now we, we would have sort of a two-way street in between uh, machine learning and neuroscience. And Maria Taneva has done some really cool work in this direction where she had this theory of what she calls super word meaning being represented in a sentence. This is meaning that's kind of derived from a, a combination of words that's not merely the result of the addition of their words together. So what's an example? Um, yeah, so if you say, um, Mary finished the apple, um, what did she do with the apple? She ate it, right? Uh, but that the thought is that doesn't follow from Mary, apple, or finished uh, merely alone, right? You have to sort of, that's what uh, Maria calls the super word meaning, is the understanding of the sentence that goes above and beyond uh, the mere additive individual components of the words um, when they're put together. There's lots of other examples of that. So she managed to locate super word meaning in large language models uh, by subtracting out the individual word meaning from the composite sentences uh, activation vectors in the model. And that gave her an idea of what information is contained in that super word meaning. And she could use that then to train decoders on fMRI data to try to decode where is the super word meaning in the human brain. So, you know, that's really cool stuff, I think. And she's she's um, continuing to do a lot of work in that direction. So um, there's lots of other stuff. So that that's just kind of sketching what I think is the best way to try to rebut some of these skeptical critiques that uh, these models really aren't doing anything like what humans do when they understand these things. Uh, it's just stochastic parrots. It's these interventionist methods. Uh, a, like I said, a group at Stanford has been uh, generalizing this into a general explainability approach. Um, uh, according to uh, philosopher of science, so Thomas Seckard is uh, is a philosopher of science, and these other guys are really hot um, computer scientists. Uh, so they're they're doing this interdisciplinary thing that I really hope uh, we see a lot more of in the future because I think it gives us a firmer foundation for progress. Um, they in particular suggest you can come up with a whole causal model that could be derived from say like a particular algorithm to solve a task, and uh, then do a series of interchange interventions of the sort that I've been talking about, whether it's, you know, iterative null space projection or the, the property editing that I talked about or whatever, to then confirm or disconfirm that causal model as being the right causal model for how the processing is going in the network. And they're even making some methods to uh, automate the discovery of the causal models to use as hypotheses. Uh, I recommend this paper too. It's a very difficult problem, but they're, they're working on it. Um, and there's not time for this, so I'll open it up for questions. Uh, thanks. I hope that wasn't too fast.